afternoon, everyone, and the first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions on infrastructure, investment and cities. Question one, Sandra White. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how full fiscal autonomy would impact on its strategic planning for areas that fall under the infrastructure, investment and cities portfolio. Secretary Nicola Sturge. Control of Scotland's resources would allow the Scottish Government significant greater flexibility to invest in strategic projects with the aim of boosting economic performance, enhancing opportunity, providing better public services and improving the environment for the people of Scotland. Andrew White. I thank the Minister for that reply. Uh, given the role played by civic society and a number of grassroots groups in shaping public debates around these new powers and how they can be used, how does the Scottish Government plan to include groups from across civic Scotland in the upcoming negotiations with the Kelvin Commission? Government Secretary. Uh, well, firstly, I would uh, want to take the opportunity to welcome Lord Smith's intention to engage with civic society and the grassroots groups who played such a, a key role in the referendum campaign. The importance of doing so was something that uh, John Swinney and I stressed to Lord Smith uh, when we met him last week. Uh, the Scottish Government also intends to engage fully with Civic Scotland and grassroots organisations as proposals for further devolution are developed and we will be encouraging and do encourage uh, all organisations across Civic Scotland to play a full role in Lord Smith's uh, commission. He set a deadline of the end of this month for groups uh, submitting proposals to him and I would encourage all those with an interest to do so. Many thanks. Question two, Drew Smith. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government how it will introduce the Glasgow and Clyde Valley City deal. Secretary Nicola Sturge. Well, obviously, Glasgow is our largest city and forms a key part of Scotland's economy. Uh, the Scottish Government has signed a city deal for Glasgow and Clyde Valley that will deliver significant benefits for the region and, uh, I believe, for Scotland as a whole. Uh, as the member will be aware, we've committed over £500 million to that deal, which will uh, run for 20 years uh, until the financial year 2034-35. Uh, the intention is that funding will be released in five-year tranches. Uh, the release of funding will be subject to gateway reviews and is contingent on Glasgow and Clyde Valley adopting satisfactory governance and assurance processes. Thanks, Mr Smith. Uh, can I thank the Deputy First Minister very much for that answer. Uh, probably the biggest barrier to Glasgow's ep economic growth that this government has created remains the issue of an effective surface transport link to Glasgow's airport. What steps will the Scottish Government now take to ensure that the opportunity of a city deal is maximised uh, and to finally take forward a practical solution for a fast connection by rail between Glasgow City Centre and Glasgow Airport? And does she now accept that the Scottish Government's decision to scrap the previous GARL scheme, uh, resulting in the land on which it would have been run being sold off at considerable loss to the public purse, now looks as short-sighted as it was misguided. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, no, I don't accept uh, that. Uh, the reasons for that particular Government decision have been well rehearsed and I think are well understood. Uh, I know uh, the member was accusing the Scottish Government of being short-sighted, not the people of Glasgow, but can I take the opportunity to say that I think the people of Glasgow uh, demonstrated anything but short-sightedness when they voted yes in the referendum a couple of weeks ago. In terms of this uh, specific question that the Order. member uh, asks, uh, he will be aware that the city deal it makes clear that improvements in terms of surface access uh, will cover the projects emerging from the Glasgow Airport study uh, and our work on a tram train uh, will inform these Glasgow City Council and Renfrewshire Council are to take forward uh, delivery and the feasibility study in that respect is currently being finalised. Um, However, all of that said, as a, a signal of our ongoing commitment to improve rail travel in the Renfrewshire area, uh, we've already provided enhanced passenger services and indeed 38 new class uh, trains, providing 130 additional carriages through the Paisley Corridor improvements. So this government remains committed to ensuring that we continue to improve uh, rail transport and I've no doubt uh, that the commitment demonstrated by the city deal will allow the local authorities involved in that city deal to continue to make progress as well. Supplementary from James Kelly. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The feasibility study that the Cabinet Secretary referred to has been ongoing for some time. Can she confirm when that will be completed and when work will begin on a timetable for introduction of the airport rail link, uh, including budgetary implications? And can she also state whether she has had discussions with the Cabinet Secretary for Finance 
about provisions for City Deal funding being included in the budget, which will be published next Thursday. Well, in relation to the uh, second part of James Kelly's question, I am sure it will not surprise him to hear I have uh, frequent and regular discussions with the Cabinet Secretary for Finance. He will uh, present his budget to the Scottish Parliament uh, next week. I will not say any more about the budget than that at this stage, except to say, as I said in my original answer to Drew Smith's question, the, government, the Scottish Government's commitment uh, to the City deal has been made absolutely clear. In terms of the uh, feasibility study, as I said in response to Drew Smith, uh, we are currently finalising the feasibility study. It's important that that work is done thoroughly, robustly and properly. Uh, the work has highlighted some challenges to the delivery of any rail link and we will continue to work with the councils to address these and of course uh, Glasgow City Council and Renfrewshire Council would take forward delivery uh, of any project. So the government's commitment to work with the councils here uh, I think is well understood and we'll continue to make progress. Many thanks. Question three, Jim Hume. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what road transport projects it plans for South Scotland. Minister Keith Brown. Uh, the Scottish Government continues to invest in road transport projects in South Scotland in accordance with the Motorway and Trunk Road Programme and the Infrastructure Investment Plan. Hume. I thank the Minister for that response. The Minister will be aware that freight traffic through Scottish ports has increased significant, significantly over the past decade, with the majority of traffic going through Stranraer and Cairn Ryan. This means A75 is experiencing greater volume of HGV traffic. And this is a particularly affecting Springholm and Crockettford, as there are only two settlements left on the A75 which haven't been bypassed. Does the Minister share my uh, safety concerns over the continuation of HGV, HGV vehicles uh, thundering through the heart of two villages which are simply not designed to take such vehicles? And would he agree to meet with me and local campaigners to find a solution to these safety concerns? Minister. Of course, I'm happy to meet uh, with the member to discuss this, but I think it is worth pointing out that the work that we've done already on the A75, Hardgrove to Kinmount, uh, a construction cost of £9 million involving the construction of a new 3.6-kilometre section of wide uh, single two-lane carriageway trunk road, uh, and other works on the A75, for example, the Dunraget Bypass. So there are a number of bypasses and a number of works which have been undertaken on the A75 to make it safer, uh, works that really could have been done quite some time ago, but this government has taken these forward. And as I've said to the member, I'm more than happy uh, to meet with him to discuss the particular issue that he's uh, uh, raised. Thanks very much. Question four, Christian Allard. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whatever it will provide an update on the proposed Aberdeen Harbour development. Keith Brown. Uh, the proposed expansion has been identified as a national development in the National Planning Framework 3. Uh, Aberdeen Harbour Board are currently undertaking preliminary environmental impact assessment work, along with consulting with stakeholders and the public on their proposals. Thank you very much. Christian Allard. I thank the Minister for the answer. Uh, could you please uh, tell us as well for over uh, North East Harbour? I know that the Scottish Government have greatly helped Fraserburgh Harbour and Peterhead Harbour. Uh, but what kind of assistance uh, can the Scottish Government is planning to give to over North East Harbours, given the ever-increasing demand from different sectors like energy, tourism and, of course, fishing? Minister. Uh, can I say that I think uh, Christian Allard makes a good point because Aberdeen Harbour's huge success and the demand which it has there has led to an impact, a positive impact on other harbours in the North East. Uh, if uh, we can help, we will help. We have engaged with those harbours. I visited, for example, Montrose Harbour, where we have funded additional works to help take on that additional demand, which they have seen. Uh, and we stand ready to help harbours in the North East, not least through European fisheries funding, where that is applicable, uh, and the Scottish Government Emergency Harbour Scheme. Uh, already, though, in excess of £60 million has been awarded to fisheries harbours in the North East of Scotland under these schemes, and that supported harbour improvements and emergency works which have directly aided fisheries sectors. As Christian Allard uh, suggests, there has been a huge uh, increase in demand for many of these harbours, some of it related to fishery, some of it related to uh, the overspill, if you like, from Aberdeen, and will continue to engage with those harbours so they can make uh, sure they meet that demand and encourage further demand. Supplementary from Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. Will the Minister confirm that the pl planned development of Aberdeen Harbour will further support the growth of offshore renewable energy uh, in the North Sea? And does the Scottish Government agree that the uh, offshore wind demonstrator project in Aberdeen Bay is of importance not just locally and nationally, but to, to the European renewable sector as a whole? 
Thank you, Minister. Well, of course, the two developments which Lewis McDonald mentions are, are very much in the minds of the Harbour Authority themselves. That's why they're taking forward these improvements. And you also know around the harbour, you can see a number of sites which have been taken over by these companies involved in these sectors, which he mentions. Uh, obviously, that's led to a huge increase in demand. That's why the Harbour Authority themselves are trying to address that. And we're very supportive of that. I've been to the harbour, I think, three times now to talk to the, the, the people there to make sure that we can help them where they can. And, of course, the potential for renewables in particular is huge. But they're also seeing a huge upsurge in demand for oil-related activity, as the member knows as well. So, yes, we are aware of those. We're supportive of what the harbour is trying to do. But it is for them in the first instance to talk to local partners to bring forward their plans. Thanks. Question five, Annabelle Ewing. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it has made an assessment of the impact on child poverty in Scotland of any UK Government freeze on child benefit. Minister Margaret Burgess. Scottish Government analysis estimates that freezing the child benefit rates for the three years from 2011-12 to 2014-15 will reduce child benefit expenditure in Scotland by around £290 million. This will affect those families with children where no one in the household earns more than £60,000. The Institute for Fiscal Studies estimates that an additional 50,000 children will be living in relative poverty by 2020 due to the UK Government welfare reforms. The figure could be as high as 100,000 children after housing costs are taken into account, and this is simply unacceptable in a country as wealthy as Scotland. Many thanks. Annabel Ewing. Uh, I thank the Minister for her answer. And does she share my concern that whether it's Tory or Labour who get in at Westminster next year, the real losers will be the hard-pressed families of Fife and across Scotland who will be hit in the pocket by the real terms cuts to child benefit being proposed by both of these Westminster parties? Minister? Yes, I do share the member's concerns that continued real-term cuts to child benefit and other working-age benefits and tax credits announced by both Labour and Conservative parties will result in reductions in household incomes for families in Scotland who are already struggling to make ends meet. The mantra of making work pay has clearly failed. Six in ten of our children in poverty now live in working households. Those households are reliant on tax credits and other benefits to raise their household income. Reducing their income in real terms only pushes them further into poverty. Thank you very much. Jackie Bailey. I think levels of child poverty are going the wrong way and it is a concern for us all. But it was a most interesting exchange um, because it might also interest the Chamber to note that there is not one word in the White Paper or the Expert Group on Welfare that sets a different course from that of the UK Government. Of course, if the Minister disagrees, could she perhaps point me to the page of either document that says otherwise? Minister. Yeah. I mean, I think there was a number of things in the white paper uh, regarding child poverty and reducing child poverty. Okay. We also had the expert working group talking about raising the, the minimum wage to, to be the living wage. We had our child... Um, our child care package. There's a number Order. of issues because child poverty, uh, presiding officer, is not just simply depending, uh, dependent on an hourly rate of pay, as Labour Party seem to think. It is a whole combination of rates of pay, numbers of hours worked, and the tax and welfare system, child care, and getting people into work. And all of those were addressed in the white paper and all remain a priority for this government. Many thanks. Question six, Jane Baxter. To ask the Scottish Government what consideration it has given to ensuring the continued viability of local bus services that have hospitals and other essential services on their routes. Minister Keith Brown. Generally, the provision of local bus services and routes is a commercial matter for individual bus operators. Local transport authorities can choose to subsidise socially necessary services not provided commercially, and some health boards already work with local authorities and RTPs to help with supporting socially necessary bus services that provide access to local health facilities. The Scottish Government provides an annual bus service operators grant currently £50 million, which aims to help keep fares at an affordable level and support the overall bus network by enabling bus operators operators to run services that might not otherwise be commercially viable. Baxter. I thank the Minister for that answer. As you will be aware, not all bus services are profitable, but they are essential for many people in rural and remote communities in reaching vital services like hospital outpatient appointments. If irregular or unreliable services mean patients from remote or rural communities miss their appointments, does the Cabinet Secretary believe there is scope to take a different approach to planning for and funding these vital public services and seeing, as, seeing them as an investment in those other services rather than a cost and perhaps um, 
promote a little bit more partnership working and looking at the cross-sectoral benefit analysis of, of the costs? Minister. I think that is why, as I've suggested in my initial answer, both local authorities uh, and regional transport partnerships and some uh, health authorities take that approach to provide services which don't make a commercial profit. I think if the member is aware, though, of individual services which he says are unreliable or late running, there is a specific remedy for that through the Traffic Commissioner, and I'm happy to provide the member with more information about that if she wants to seek uh, redress from that. But I also mentioned the £50 million bus service operators grant, and the idea behind that is to try and make sure that some services which might not otherwise be commercially viable it can run, and also we can bear down on the cost of fares as well. So there are provisions in place, more than willing to listen to further suggestions, because there is a review going on with the bus uh, users operators group, sorry, the bus users group, to look at how we can better uh, coordinate those services which are currently there. Uh, I'm happy to discuss that with the member, but also to provide her with more information about the role of the traffic commissioner. Many thanks. Question seven, Ken McIntosh. I thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what conclusions it has drawn from the funding for the Help to Buy scheme being fully allocated within three months. Minister Margaret Burgess. The Scottish <laughs> Government continues to consider the impact of all our home ownership and industry support schemes, including Help to Buy Scotland. What is clear from recent experience is that the scheme has been very successful in achieving its stated aims of stimulating demand, supporting home ownership, supporting industry and encouraging wider economic activity and growth. Thank you. Ken McIntosh. Can I thank the Minister for her reply? I'm sure she'll also be aware, though, of the dismay and disappointment felt by uh, many potential applicants and amongst those in the housing industry at the funds running out so quickly. Can I ask if any analysis has been carried out, in particular, into unmet demand for the Help to Buy scheme? And does the Minister have a view to amend the criteria used to decide on applications under the Help to Buy scheme? Minister. The Help to, to Buy scheme is monitored uh, on a monthly basis by the, our partners in industry, the Council of Mortgage Lenders and Homes for Scotland. We are also uh, looking at now that the scheme has been running for a year. The demand did well exceed the expectation of both the industry and every, the house building uh, industry and the Council of Mortgage Lenders. They initially had anticipated uh, £220 million uh, for the scheme and it has been significantly higher and that we, we did top up by a further £50 million this financial year. But it is currently under consideration. All of the issues that the, the member raises are uh, under active consideration at the moment. Thanks. Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Yesterday, during the housing supply debate, the Minister stated the budget for Help to Buy for next year is £100 million, £40 million less than this year, and applications are being sought now. Can the Minister tell the Chamber when she expects that pot to run out? Mr. This is a demand-led scheme, as we said earlier, primarily set up um, to stimulate the housing industry, and it has done that and create wider economic activity. What we have said is £100 million has been set aside uh, for 2015-16. Uh, uh, applications are currently being made. Nobody uh, has been refused to make an application, and we're still monitoring it on a monthly basis. And I refer to the answer I gave Ken McIntosh a few minutes ago. Jackie Bailey. Forgive me. Right, question eight, Colin Beatty. To ask the Scottish Government how an extension of the 1% cap on child benefit to 2017 would impact on its poverty strategy. Mr. Margaret Burgess. Our analysis suggests that extending the 1% cap would reduce child benefit expenditure in Scotland by around £10 million in 2016-17. As outlined in my earlier response, our efforts to tackle poverty in Scotland are already being undermined by the current range of welfare and benefit changes being imposed by the UK Government. Our most recently published statistics show the reduction in poverty in Scotland seen in recent years is now being reversed. Overall, these changes threaten the success of our preventative approach to tackling child poverty and the actions we are taking to improve outcomes for children and deliver the wealthier and fairer society we aspire to. Colin Beatty. I thank the Minister for her response. Does the Minister agree with me that Westminster should agree to devolve welfare powers to allow the Scottish Government to protect its citizens from these cuts? Minister. The UK parties have made much of their commitments to devolve further welfare powers, yet in their, yet in their proposals they, they refer only to limited powers. 
In order to tackle poverty and protect citizens from these cuts, we want to deliver new powers for Scotland capable of making a real difference to people's lives. We will therefore work with the Smith Com Commission in good faith and strongly argue the case for more powers for Scotland. And briefly in this session, finally, Jackie Bailey. On that basis, can I ask the Minister what she would do on child benefit and give her a second chance to tell me what page of the White Paper or the expert group on welfare points to a different approach to child benefit than that taken by the UK? Thank you. Minister Margaret Burgess. I think um, what we've seen is that the Labour Party have signed up to the austerity cuts that we already have from the Coalition in Westminster, and we made it very clear that we would not be part of that, and we covered all of those in the White Paper, and I explained that in my earlier question. But, however, we, what is being said here that clearly Labour are embarrassed by the position of their Westminster uh, masters. And moving swiftly on to culture and external affairs portfolio questions. I'll give one second uh, for the Cabinet Secretary and invite uh, Gil Patterson to raise question one, please, Mr Patterson. Thanks very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the positive outcomes are of the International Culture Summit held in Edinburgh in August 2014. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. The second Edinburgh International Culture Summit um, at the Scottish Parliament was hailed as a great success by participants and delegates. The summit brought together 25 international government delegations from six continents with speakers, arts leaders and culture experts from across the world. It was recognised as a truly global collaboration on the current day uh, role of uh, culture and the arts and saw a call for culture to be placed at the centre of government policy making and for a more unified voice for the arts across the world. The meetings I had with other culture ministers helped to deepen and strengthen our international links. Uh, for example, the Japanese minister is particularly interested in the Commonwealth Games uh, culture programme and legacy as they prepare for the 2020 Olympic Games. In total, during the summit, we received requests from 16 governments Governments to work further with us, and we continue to explore those opportunities. Many thanks. Gil Patterson. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that the Edinburgh International Culture Summit was a unique opportunity for culture ministers, artists, thinkers, and art leaders from around the world to come together to share ideas and discuss the power, position, and profile of the arts, culture, and creative industries? and which was, has greatly enhanced the global reputation of Scotland in the area of arts and culture. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. A strong global reputation for arts and culture, the opportunity to be seen as world leaders in taking debate forward, I think has particularly enhanced uh, the reputation of Scotland itself, of this parliament, but of all the participants. It's a, a unique opportunity to bring together not just ministers, but to have direct dialogue um, uh, and, and creative uh, thinking taking place between artists themselves uh, from across all the different uh, parts of the world. Uh, big challenges to Scotland were made, but also, I think, celebration of Scottish culture. The Scottish at 10 exhibition was held here and also the great Scottish tapestry was on show at the time and uh, the presiding officer may be uh, interested to know that the delegations had the opportunity to make their own mark upon uh, the Scottish tapestry and they stitched a specially commissioned uh, summit panel uh, and I'm sure that will be something that the, the, uh, the delegations will remember and uh, the challenges they had not just in thinking but also in stitching. Just without saying, question to Mary Fee. To ask the Scottish Government how much it spent in 2013-14 on renovating historic buildings in West Scotland. Secretary Fiona Hislop. The Scottish Government supports the conservation, repair and restoration of historic buildings through Historic Scotland's work. Uh, historic Scotland's building repair grant uh, provided grant support totalling £974,000 in the West of Scotland region in 2013-14. Uh, Scottish Government regeneration funding has also contributed to the restoration of two historic buildings in the West of Scotland in 2013-14, Trinity Church in Irvine and the former police station within the Adrosson Health Centre facility uh, with grant provided totalling £895,000. Historic Scotland also provide expert advice and support and are responsible for properties in care in West Scotland, carrying out conservation work, maintenance and sympathetic repair. Mary Fee. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Can the Cabinet Secretary tell me what strategy the Scottish Government have to encourage local people and local community groups to get involved in looking after and promoting historic properties? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, 
Can I say that's uh, one of the areas I'm particularly keen on, and the uh, uh, Historic Scotland uh, have uh, programmes in place to help bring communities together. There's some very good examples. I know I take part in one in my own constituency, but also I'd refer you to our place in time, the, the strategy, the, the new and first ever historic environment strategy for Scotland that's brought together all the different agencies. It's not just Historic Scotland, but also I had a meeting yesterday with Ken Calman from the National Trust for Scotland, all the different agencies and organisations involved um, to help help identify how we can support volunteers that are working to help promote the local um, sites, but also adopt a, a monument is something, for example, the archaeology services have been supporting. We're very keen to help support that as well. There are different avenues, and if she has any particular examples that she's interested in, I'm happy to provide her with details later. Many thanks. Question three, Michael McMahon. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to analyse the impact of its 2014 major event strategy. Uh, 2014 has been a year in which we have extended a welcome to the world. Interim results have confirmed the anticipated positive impacts of what was right, widely regarded as the best Commonwealth Games ever and record numbers of visitors to events forming part of the Homecoming 2014 programme. The Ryder Cup, along with Scotland's second year of Homecoming and the Commonwealth Games, will all be subject of independent evaluation and the findings for each of these signature elements of Scotland's major event strategy will be published by spring 2015. Uh, presenting officer, we have just witnessed a very successful Ryder Cup competition, showcasing yet again that Scotland is the perfect stage for major events, and I'm sure the Chamber would want to join me in congratulating all those involved with its delivery and the European Ryder Cup team for the victory. Absolutely. Mr McMahon? The Secretary for her response, and I, I certainly would welcome uh, our, our, uh, joining the congratulations to all involved in the Ryder Cup for the success that last, last weekend clearly was, not just for the tournament itself, but for the whole of Scotland, as was the case with the, the Commonwealth Games. But does the Cabinet Secretary accept that a lot of uh, community-based uh, events, festivals and, and other um, undertakings mm -hmm. that occurred in relation to the year of homecoming um, also require mm -hmm. support to continue uh, with the success that they've achieved throughout this year, and can the Cabinet Secretary give us an idea of how much uh, attention is going to be paid to the development and continued support for those uh, community-based organisations who uh, certainly made a major contribution to the year of homecoming also? Thank you. I, I share the, the members' um, appreciation of the, all the festivals that take place um, in supporting our events. Obviously, the question was on uh, some of the major events, but in terms of our festivals and our community festivals, we actually had a debate in Parliament during the summer precisely to recognise, yes, the Edinburgh International Festivals, yes, uh, the cultural legacy and programme of the Commonwealth Games, but also all the other community festivals that take place. Uh, just last week, we announced funding for the winter festivals, and some of those festivals are based on existing smaller uh, community festivals and I think that's one of the strengths that we have in Scotland that at different times of the year you can come to Scotland and there are festivals exploding all over the country and I think that's part of the legacy of recognising years of homecoming but also themed years and how we can capitalise on that very warm welcome that I talked about in, the, in that debate but also the fact we are the perfect stage not just in the summer but throughout the years for people coming to visit Scotland. Excellent, any thanks? Question for Hans Ala Malik. Uh, thank you and good afternoon, Presiding Officer. I declare an interest in visiting Kurdistan Regional Government at the invitation of the Inter Ministry of Interior. I ask the Scottish Government whether it plans to use the International Development Fund to provide support for the Kurdistan region of Iraq. Sir Humza Yusuf. The Scottish Government does not currently have any plans to provide financial support to the Kurdistan region of Iraq through our International Development Fund. However, we are uh, closely monitoring the situation and remain very concerned about the plight of the people who have been affected by the recent violence, which we condemn, of course, in the strongest possible terms. Hanzala Malik. Uh, I'm glad that the Minister shares my concern about the Kurdistan regional, region of Iraq. The region has not only bore the brunt of the humanitarian crisis caused by the violent process made by NCEL, ISIL militants, but also has been sev severely underdeveloped through generations of oppression. In his comments yesterday, he stated that the, regional, the Kurdistan region of Iraq requires a long-term st strategic solution, which I agree with wholeheartedly. Um, I am also glad that he, he is taking that view. Given these, yeah, give, given these circumstances, will he 
take uh, steps to actually ensure that the long-term strategic view takes into account the International Development Fund does include Iraq, uh, Kurdistan area, and also will really support the new organization formed called KISS, which is called Kurdistan, is supported by Scotland, who are fundraising to send doctors to, uh, from Scotland to the refugee camps in Kurdistan, which I have visited myself, and I look forward to his support in encouraging military and um, medical aid to Kurdistan region. Minister? Well, let me recognize the work that the, me the member has done in the Kurdistan region. Uh, of Iraq. I'm more than happy to, of course, meet the member at any time to discuss ways that we can support the Kurdistan region, including uh, the new organization, KISS, I think he called it, uh, the new organization that's been formed. More than happy to, to meet and commit to, to meet. I'm meeting with representatives of the KRG, Kurdistan Regional Government, next week, an event I think he will also probably uh, be at and happy to discuss further ways that we can support. But his, the, the crux of his question is, of course, the, the fundamental point. There must be a long-term strategic vision uh, for, uh, that it protects the the rights and the freedoms of the people uh, of the Kurdistan region of Iraq. I'm happy to give support in that, in, in that way. Briefly, Bob Doris. Um, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, I made a similar declaration to Mr. Mr. Malik uh, yesterday at Topical Questions on a similar point in, in, in specific uh, to, to the question at hand. In providing support for the humanitarian need within the Kurdish region of Iraq, would the Scottish Government consider using expertise within our own NHS where appropriate to assist if we can, as well as drawing our pharmaceutical sector who may be able to help with access to vital medicines in refugee camps? Minister. Well, I'd also like to put on record uh, and, and note uh, the member Bob Doris's uh, own work in, in Kurdistan, uh, both in, in Iraq and, and, and Syria uh, as well. Uh, in a meeting with uh, the member, he knows that uh, those issues were raised in terms of uh, NHS support in Scotland and also uh, support from the pharmaceutical industry in terms of medicine. I'm more than happy to explore them, more than happy. Uh, I think the member is going to write some correspondence to that effect from our meeting last week to engage with the Cabinet Secretary for Health and well-being, but I think uh, any assistance that we are able to provide on the humanitarian side, uh, you'll not find this government coming short uh, at all in terms of, of doing that. Jimmy McGregor. Um, thank you. Uh, the progress made by ISIL in June came as a big shock to the international community. It's clear that the group's advance was facilitated not just by the unrest in Syria, but by the inability of the Iraqi army to successfully fight back in the north of the country. It's therefore very important to be sure that alongside airstrikes, Iraq has the ability to make progress on the ground. Will the minister join me in welcoming the announcement earlier in September that the UK had agreed to supply heavy machine guns and half a million rounds of ammunition to the Peshmerga fighters in northern Iraq? That's not a question on international aid, and you don't need to answer it, therefore, minister. I will move to question five. Richard Simpson, please. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to support traditional Scottish music and dance. Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, in recognition of Scotland's uh, vibrant traditional arts and their importance to our cultural heritage and to our national identity, the Scottish Government provides significant support to ensure that our traditional music and dance continue to flourish and shape Scotland's culture for future generations. Alongside promotion and support through Events Scotland for major events, including Homecoming Scotland 2014, the Scottish Government supports the traditional music and dance sector primarily through Creative Scotland, which disperses more than £2 million uh, each year to organisations, individuals and festivals that directly form part of the sector. Uh, these include activity in the year of Homecoming, the 2014 Cultural Programme, as well as the Fesh Movement, the Traditional Music and Song Association of Scotland, Hands Up for Trad, BBC Alpa and Piping Live. Richard Simpson. Can I thank, thank the Minister for that uh, response? Uh, in terms of traditional dance, uh, some 18 years ago, the previous uh, funding arrangement through the Council uh, said that the dysfunctional system of traditional dance, which was made up of very small groups across Scotland, really required an umbrella organisation. That organisation was set up and funded by the Arts Council um, for some years, but some three, four years ago, the grant was halved and then terminated completely with the closure of their office in Alawa. Traditional dance no longer has a professional small umbrella organisation focusing its activities. I wonder if the Minister would care to comment on the fact that this has actually occurred. Thank you. Minister. Uh, 
Well, I, I can't comment on what happened 18, 18 years ago. He's talking about uh, an event a few years ago. I might not be aware, but actually um, all the different aspects of uh, Scottish traditional culture and arts have come together under one body called Tracks. Um, that brings together dance, music, storytelling. Indeed, only this morning um, I uh, launched the uh, 2014 Storytelling Festival um, and supported by that, uh, the new organisation Tracks, which brings together the traditional arts sector in Scotland. And that has actually, I think, taken forward the collaboration between music, dance and all the different aspects of uh, Scottish traditions. But I'm happy to write to the member to perhaps give a, 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 a wider explanation of where dance fits in in that umbrella group that now exists. Excellent. Question six, Graham Day. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and what matters were discussed. Minister Humza Yousaf. The Cabinet Secretary for Culture and External Affairs last met with the Minister of State for Europe, uh, the Right Honourable David Lennington MP, in a meeting of the Joint Ministerial Committee of Europe uh, on the 16th of June 2014. The readout of uh, that was provided to the convener of the European External Relations Committee on the 13th of June 2014. We correspond often with the Foreign and Commonwealth Office on other matters on a frequent basis. And this week I've been in touch with the FCO regarding the case of Mohammed Askar, the Scot, uh, currently on uh, death row uh, in Pakistan. Um, sorry, forgive me, Graham Day. Uh, thank you. I thank the Minister for that answer. Specifically on that point, can I ask what specific representation has been made by the Scottish Government on behalf of Mohammed Askar, the 70-year-old Scot sentenced to death in Pakistan over blasphemy charges? As the Minister will be aware, it's been reported that Mr Askar was shot by a prison guard in the jail in Royal Pindi where he was being held. Additionally, Mr Askar is said to have a history of mental illness. Does the Minister share the concern of the Chamber for this individual's health and well-being? Minister? Uh, yes, uh, we do. We are extremely concerned about the plight uh, of Mohammed Askar. Uh, we have been for many months. Uh, the First Minister himself has directly intervened in this uh, case, has spoken directly face to face with uh, Governor Mohammed Sawa, the Governor uh, of the Punjab, where uh, Mohammed Askar is being held. I spoke to the FCO this week, as well as speaking to Governor Sawa, as well as speaking to the Pakistani, uh, any other Pakistani authorities, and the family lawyer, and the family uh, themselves. The immediate priorities are twofold. Uh, first of all, to ensure that Mohammed Askar is uh, kept safe and secure. Uh, that means not being returned to Adiala prison where he was shot. Uh, and secondly, of course, ensuring that Mohammed Askar gets the appropriate medical attention uh, that he needs. He is severely mentally unwell and he needs that psychiatric assessment, but importantly, uh, the, the medication to help to improve uh, his health. Those are the immediate priorities, as well as, of course, working with the family, with the legal team and with the Pakistani authorities to secure Mr Askar's return. But let me assure the member that uh, we are extremely concerned and the Scottish Government is doing absolutely everything it can within its power to ensure uh, Mr Askar's health and safety and security. Jamie McGregor. Thank you. Um, does the Minister agree with me that the security and prosperity of Hong Kong is underpinned by the fundamental freedoms and rights as stated in the Sino-British Joint Declaration. Does he further agree with me that these freedoms are best guaranteed by the transition to universal suffrage? Minister? Uh, yes, I agree on both those points. I, I saw the uh, FCO statement uh, from a couple of days ago on the 29th, and they reiterated uh, absolutely those points. And we agree that those freedoms are best guaranteed with the transition to universal suffrage. And we hope that that upcoming consultation period will produce arrangements uh, which will allow a meaningful advance uh, for democracy in Hong Kong. We encourage all parties to engage constructively in discussions to that end. So I agree entirely with the two points that the member raises. Thank you very much. Question seven, Margaret MacDougall. To ask the Scottish Government what figures it has on the closure of museums and libraries over the last five years. The Scottish Library and Information Council advises that from 2008-9 to 2012-13, 22 public libraries in Scotland have closed, reducing the total from 628 to 606. That equates to 3.6% in Scotland compared to 7.9% in England, 11.1% in Wales and 11.5% in Northern Ireland for the same period. In 13-14, a further four public libraries closed, reducing the total to 602. Figures on museums uh, on closures are not held centrally, it is estimated there are around 400 museums in Scotland. Thank you, and briefly as possible, Margaret MacDougall, please. I thank the Minister for that answer. Given that budgets are so tight, many councils are considering cuts to culture and arts budgets during consultations with the public. 
As a result, many more museums and libraries could be put under threat in the future. So what is the Scottish Government doing to make sure that local libraries and museums are sustained because they make such a valuable contribution to civic life and they are often the only opportunity the less well-off have to learn about their local history or access books and computers and hence their opportunities in life? Briefly, Cabinet Secretary, please. Members, support for our local libraries to such an extent that in the, the joint um, meeting that we have with COSLA, with all the conveners of culture services across Scotland, uh, libraries have been a frequent and recurring uh, discussion point for us, and we as a government will do what we can to help support the growing and developing role of libraries. And can I say that despite the severe restrictions placed upon us by the Westminster budget, that despite that, local authorities have actually relatively, bearing in mind that they have no uh, responsibilities statutory for arts and culture generally, have generally not reduced arts and culture budget more than any other areas. So we will keep that dialogue going and with the support of our local authority colleagues, we will support uh, and continue to support lo our local libraries. Many thanks. And we'll now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 11030.